Good morning, everyone. I uh, would like to welcome you to our uh, news conference. And the topic today is uh, raising the minimum federal minimum wage. Uh, this is also um, the beginning of a summer surge for justice activities in Rock. I am the director, Christopher White, of Rock, Michigan. I am uh, pleased to uh, acknowledge that we have a wonderful uh, panel of speakers that represent the African-American church and various uh, faith communities, uh, elected officials, community leaders, and most important as, as we all are, are the people who we hear to serve the workers of the state of Michigan. I like to uh, acknowledge uh, Rock staff who is in this event, uh, starting off with the Michigan chapter. Our uh, team is a fabulous, a strong, dedicated team. Uh, Alan Lee, Mr. Alan Lee, our, our case planner, child coordinator, raise uh, coordinator, our great organizing team, Sarah Coffey, our organizer, Laura McIntyre, who organizes in the Flint Genesee region, and Brenda Hill, who's a longtime community activist and organizer. I'd like to acknowledge also on the call, the senior leadership team led by our president and CEO, Dr. Seiko Sibby. In addition to that, we have in the audience, and he wears two hats, he is our national child director. He is Prabhu Sigrani, and he is also a member of the United Church of Christ in Long Island, New York. And also on the call, we have our child students, which is our um, culinary school and workforce development program. They are here to join us because they are the future of the industry. It is important to note that this is the 12th anniversary of the last time the federal minimum wage was increased. And that stands at $7.25 since an hour. This is long overdue and time for an increase. That uh, wage we consider to be uh, basically obsolete. And throughout the nation, we have had several um, different activities and people and leaders such as the people you will hear from today who have been advocating for an increase in the federal minimum wage. And that is uh, a large part of what this activity is about. I will be your moderator today and just do a little housekeeping, except for speakers. Everyone will be muted during the entire presentation from our speakers. For the reporters on this call, please post your name and your organization at, at any given time in the chat so we can keep track of who is in this uh, call. And then we will be uh, taking questions. If you'd like, you can post your questions in the chat. But after the speakers have uh, concluded, we will take questions. I will uh, now uh, turn it over to our Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Alicia Renee Ferris, the Chief Operating Officer at Rock United. Dr. Ferris. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and needless to say, COVID-19 has been devastating in our communities, yet enlightening. It, is, it, it has exposed the true economic injustices that exist in Michigan and throughout this country, especially in communities of color. COVID-19 has shown us that there's really no safety net for our most vulnerable populations. At best, a temporary lifeline has been cast via stimulus and unemployment checks. It is indeed a travesty that so many vulnerable workers were forced to work as essential workers without the possibility of protecting themselves. According to the Economic Policy Institute, there are 55 million essential workers nationwide, including 11.3 million food service workers, 4 million warehouse and delivery workers, and 16.6 million healthcare workers. Many of these workers are only paid minimum wage. This press event is part of the Summer Surge for Justice series that Rock United is organizing in Michigan and other states such as Mississippi, New York, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and Washington, DC. As Chris mentioned, 
Today, July 23rd is significant as it marks the 12th anniversary of the date that the federal minimum wage was, la was last raised. That amount, of course, $7.25. This is the longest period in the history of the, the minimum wage where we haven't seen an increase at the federal level. There isn't a single county in the country where 725 is enough to make ends meet. And this inequity hits women and black and brown people the hardest. Raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, which is the current movement underway, would raise the wages of 19 million essential workers. It would raise the wage for one in three black workers and one in four Latino workers and lift 3.7 million people up and out of poverty, including 1.3 million children. Because they have understood the importance of promoting the value of every human being and eliminating the suffering and oppression of those whose voices are ignored, faith leaders have often be at, been at the forefront of justice movements. As evidenced here today in this press conference, faith leaders have joined hands with civil rights and community-based organizations, grassroots activists, and elected officials who have put uh, before who have put people before politics, the ones that are here today, actually, to change pot to make positive social change. This Sunday, July 25th, in tradition of King in nonviolence, we are dramatizing the fact that 725 is not enough. And therefore, we have launched a pulpit awareness campaign. This educational campaign is to increase awareness that after the, seven, the 12 long years and a world pandemic, the federal minimum wage of $7.25, nor the current minimum, Michigan minimum wage of $9.65 represent a living wage. It is my privilege to present Bishop J. Drew Sheard, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Yay, me too, Bishop. Bishop is a God man, a dedicated family man, and the proud pastor of Greater Emmanuel Institutional Church of God in Christ on Schaefer in Detroit. Last month, uh, praise God, Bishop Sheard was installed as the presiding bishop and chief apostle of the Church of God in Christ, which has congregations in 112 countries around the world. I present to you Bishop Sheard. Thank you, Dr. Ferris, and uh, I too join with you and what you have stated. 12 years is a very long time to go without an increase. Uh, national, as has been stated, national minimum wage is at $7.25 an hour. Of course, here in Michigan, we're doing just a tad bit better than the national, but it is not enough. It is high time for us to take care of the backbone of our communities, the backbone of our country, which are the working class citizens. We would like to see the minimum wage increase to a minimum of $13.65 per hour. And yet we actually would like to see it a little bit higher. We're calling on those in Congress to adhere to our call and let us be found doing what is best for our working class, which can be noted as the least of us sometime as Jesus said in the Bible, they are the backbone of our society. And so I thank you, Dr. Ferris, and I want to encourage every clergyman to join us on this Sunday, this coming Sunday, uh, July 25th, in, pu in pushing this issue to our congregants and all over our communities. We need to let those who are in authority know that we are expecting them to do something about helping our people, our people who are the backbone of our country. Thank you for this space and may God bless you. And I look forward to us having success in our efforts. Thank you, Bishop Shear, and as always, a wonderful job of uh, serving the world in your new capacity. And all of us are providing service in our all right, especially 
our next uh, presenter and speaker, uh, Dr. the Reverend Dr. Wallace Mills Jr., who is the BME State Convention President and Pastor of New Ebenezer Baptist Church. I turn it over to Reverend Dr. Wallace Mills Jr. Thank you, Brother Chris. Good morning, everyone. Listen, I am uh, appreciative for the opportunity to be able to come and to share uh, and to and to be a part of this forum. I also like uh, like Bishop Shears uh, stand uh, with you all in this effort uh, to try to move our society forward uh, in raising the minimum wage. Uh, Fifteen dollars an hour is is a feasible wage. Uh, and it allows us the opportunity, our people, the opportunity uh, to be able to live some type of life that is normal. Uh, as a religious leader in the city of Detroit, uh, many times we find ourselves as congregations uh, stretching our budgets that we too might be able to feed our people and house our people and assist them with bill payments. I want to encourage this, uh, this United States of America, the Congress, uh, President of the United States as well, uh, to push uh, forward with this uh, minimum wage increase, uh, that the lives of our people might be blessed, that the lives of our people might be changed, and that society might be able to move forward uh, for the better. I encourage our BME churches already to start standing on Sunday uh, and proclaiming uh, Sunday as uh, 725, uh, you know, Sunday, where we speak to the increase uh, of the minimum wage. May the Lord bless you all. Thank you again for the opportunity of sharing. Thank you, the Honorable uh, Reverend Dr. Mills. And I also uh, take a little time to do a, a light sweep of housekeeping. If you have any questions, please, please place them in the chat. Uh, we are thankful to have uh, this panel here and thank members of the media for coming out. You've currently heard from two of our uh, greatest um, leaders in the faith community and more are to come, but we also have uh, the people who get it done in the House of Representatives. Yes. Coming out of the mighty seventh district, uh, a champion for our people fighting not only uh, Northwest and parts of Detroit and other, other cities, but the state of Michigan, Representative Alina Scott, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate that introduction. And listen, any time that I can advocate for workers to raise the minimum wage, I am here. So prior to being elected um, last year in 2020 and joining the Michigan State House of Representatives to represent House District 7, I'm proud to say that in 2018, I was the lead organizer with Southeast Michigan Jobs with Justice and working on Rock United's One Fair Wage campaign. So I worked tirelessly to support the ballot initiative with my Southeast Michigan Jobs with Justice colleagues um, we were a team of three. Uh, they're on the line today, uh, Sam Stark and Kay Halonen. We gathered over 5,000 signatures in support of raising the state's minimum wage to $12 per hour by 2022 at that time. Also, we were looking to eliminate the tip sub minimum wage by 2024. Sadly, we know that the will of over 400,000 Michigan voters that supported the ballot initiative was thwarted by the state legislature. Instead of honoring the will of all of the voters, they adopted the Improved Workforce Opportunity Act to supposedly raise the minimum wage. And then they removed the initiative from the ballot prior to the November elections. And to add insult to injury, during the 2018 lame duck session, a few weeks after the election, but before the newly elected legislator was seated, the Republican-led Michigan legislator, legislature reversed their decision and passed a new bill to block the long overdue raises that would have brought working families' paychecks closer to rising costs um, you know, so a living cost where they could really live across the state. In 2018, Michigan workers were truly robbed. If they had gotten the overdue raises that they truly deserve, workers would have seen their paychecks grow. They would have had an opportunity to afford basic necessities, save for the future and achieve some economic security. 
if the legislature hadn't robbed Michigan voters of their right and their raise to a fair living wage, um, <clears throat> we would right now be preparing to welcome a $12 minimum wage for these workers next year. Because I've been fighting to raise the minimum wage as an organizer and a labor activist for workers for years, it should come as no surprise as a newly elected official and legislator that I worked with my Democratic colleagues to co-sponsor House Bill 4413. If that passes in this leg legislature, it would raise the minimum wage to $11 per hour beginning January 1st, 2022, and increase wages a dollar per year through 2026, making an hourly rate for workers of $15 per hour. But because we know <laughs> that the history often repeats itself. And this Republican led House and Senate have not been focused at all on raising wages for workers in the past in this state. Rock is spearheading a national effort to win $15 minimum wage per hour for workers. And I believe that all Michiganders should support it and stand behind it because I as an activist and in the state legislature I certainly will. So I definitely am a proponent of $15 an hour. Quite frankly, I think that 15 isn't enough. It really should be more, but we need to start somewhere and the time is now. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Scott. Now, our next speaker is someone who is known to many of us. He is known for the service that he continues to provide and is a model for our leadership. Coming out of a Saginaw, Pastor Hurley Coleman Jr. over the World Outreach Campus Church in Saginaw, Michigan. I turn it over to you, Pastor Coleman. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm excited to be a part of this wonderful uh, array of leaders and speakers and uh, to add my thoughts to this conversation about the minimum wage. That's great value in history, especially when you look back to understand not only the position that you're in, but what you're positioned for. And as faith leaders, it has always been our, our role to encourage the laity, encourage the citizens to move collectively to allow things to happen. It was that great courage that the pastors and faith leaders of the Reconstruction era led the creation of colleges and schools and programs throughout the country. And six, 53 years ago, 53, just 53 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King was in Memphis fighting for almost exactly the same thing that we're doing now. It's amazing, as, as Representative Scott said, how history repeats itself. And so now it becomes incumbent upon us as faith leaders to launch out there and be courageous in our pulpits to encourage our members, encourage those who follow us, that it's time to speak up. The legislature on the state and national level must hear the voices of the people, and the people will hear the voices of their leaders. As faith leaders, it's critical for us to stand there in the gap. It, 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 if you think about it, there, there, I've been paying attention to this, this acronym of ALICE, A-L-I-C-E, Asset Limited Income Constrained But Employed. There are many people in our pews who are working every day and they're working at a minimum wage, which is so far below what it would take to actually live comfortably. Those are the same people whose voices can be risen as we encourage them. So I stand with Bishop Sheard and with Dr. Mills and with all of the others who are on this particular uh, moment to encourage every faith leader, when you stand on 725, Remember that that's the, that's the same number that should be lifted from where it is. And I encourage you, pastors, faith leaders, to stand courageously and boldly, and let's speak collectively toward moving us forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Coleman, for those elaborate remarks. And it is the truth, and we must all stand, because as uh, Dr. Fair said earlier, 725 is not enough. And that's a, a slogan that we will continue to push. And our next speaker is an expert entrepreneur in the industry. Uh, she's a chef that 
we all know, and I've seen her mentor people with my own you know, eyes and, and a lot of people look to her and she's a champion for this issue. I bring to you uh, Chef Nick Cole. I turn it over to you. Good morning. Hi, I'm Chef Nick Renee Cole and I'm a chef and a storyteller born here, born and raised here in Detroit. Um, at this point, I've been in the industry for about 17 years and I've held several positions in, the rest, in, in several restaurants. Um, while in the industry, I've been able to put myself through college and help both of my children go to colleges of their choice. My daughter is currently in her second year at Spelman. Um, I've also been able to make a career for myself where I'm able to set my own wages and my own pay rates. And while I'm very proud of the success that I've had in the industry, every single day I come in contact and work with people who um, are not as, I'm sorry, who um make minimum wage i've never been a person to settle for minimum anything um but there's many people who don't have the same opportunity that i do i watch them juggle bills they can't afford to eat or play in the very environments that they work so hard in every single day minimum wages are not living wages they aren't allowed for people they don't allow for people to take a break they can't afford to get um to get sick many can't afford child care and can barely afford to put gas in their cars to even get back and forth to work. We always see increases, well, usually see increases starting from the very top, especially in the bigger corporations. But what about the people who work often on the front lines? When will they able to end the cycle of struggle? That's why it's important for Michigan to change minimum wage from, from $9.65 to $15, which is um, still below living wages. Um, I don't think this is a want. I very much don't think that it's a need. Thank you. Thank you, Chef Cole. Our next speaker is a friend of Rock and has been a, a champion as well in the legislature. Coming out of the 31st District in the state of Michigan, the Honorable Representative Bill Sowerby. Bill Sowerby, Rep, you're up. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this important uh, press conference on raising minimum wage. Uh, my name is Bill Sowerby. I represent the city of Mount Clemens, most of Clinton Township and the city of Fraser in District 31 in Macomb County. Uh, this issue is dear to my heart. Uh, Representative Scott so eloquently spoke to her personal hard work efforts with the one fair wage movement in that petition drive that should have been on the ballot in 2018. I was there in the legislature during those, that awful period, watched as the disingenuous Republican led uh, legislature uh, brought forward that uh, petition and adopted it and hardworking minimum wage workers all assumed in September of 2018 that they received an increase in wages of 12 to $12 an hour by 2022, only to have in December of 2018, the again disingenuous decision to rob them of their wages by repealing that decision of September of 2018 and took it away. I then in the uh, my next uh, term introduced the uh, bill that would repeal that awful uh, decision of December of 2018 and raise the minimum wage to 2000 uh, to, to you know $22 or I'm sorry $12 an hour by 2022 this is 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 an issue that's you know dear to my heart in that you know we saw these workers be robbed of by 2022 of nearly $11,000 of increased wages Today, minimum wage workers here in Michigan would have been making $11.65 an hour today instead of just $9.65. That means a loss in monthly revenue that these workers should have been getting paid, $277 a month. Imagine what that would mean to a minimum wage worker in the ability to uh, purchase food and other staples for their living, pay for rent, um, if they can afford a car, to be able to pay for the uh, repairs on that car, uh, provide education to their kids. All of that, again, 
robbed of them because of that decision in 2018. Now, we're here today to talk about the national minimum wage of $7.25. And that in, in inflation terms means $6.11 is what people are really earning. And we know that we can get the attention of our federal lawmakers by way, raising our own minimum wage here in Michigan. Um, back when one fair wage was trying to do $12 an hour, that was a compromise, much supported. We're beyond that. We need to move it to $15 minimum wage here in Michigan. And Representative Abraham Ayash from Hamtramck has introduced that bill we should be having regular discussions and movements to have that happen. But we also know that as the states move in the right direction on issues, it puts tremendous pressure on the federal level to do the same. We've got to move this issue forward and make this happen in Michigan to get that $15 minimum wage. So that puts further pressure on our federal level people to get that out of that $7.25 and make it a livable wage. I'll end with this, and that is that I will always be an ally of this issue of raising people out of poverty and giving them a better way of living. And this is my values. It's what I was raised under. My, my mother, who, uh, who came out of severe poverty after the Great Depression and through her uh, entire youth, as a young woman had the opportunity to go to Mary Grove College where she earned her degree in social work and became a social worker and championed human rights issues, civil rights issues, all of her life. Um, she ended up becoming a leader in back in the 60s and 70s in uh, WRO, the Welfare Rights Organization, championing farm workers' rights and wa raising wages. Uh, she was also one of the leaders in Michigan after the civil unrest that occurred here in the city of Detroit 54 years ago today um, due to racial injustices. She then created the Northeast Interface Center for Racial Justice on the Northeast side of Detroit in Macomb County. I live with these, uh, these values. I say that because I will never forget her cheering the decision of the John, President Johnson administration when he declared the war on poverty. 50 years ago, a half century ago, we are still having this discussion about raising people out of poverty. And this is shameful. And this has to end now. From our servers in our restaurants who rely on the kindness of their customers to offset their awful minimum wages by through tipping to our hardworking grocery store workers who are still underpaid, yet those chain grocery stores who made oodles of money in, in the pandemic have not shared their wealth with their employees. We continue to see our healthcare workers in hospitals and our healthcare workers on the streets not getting paid a fair wage. This has to change. We not only have to change this in Michigan, we have to change this nationally. And we will continue to do that with Representative Scott and myself and the other great legislators in Lansing who will continue to champion this issue. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Representative Sowerby. I'd like to also acknowledge that uh, Pastor White represented the Council of Baptist Pastors in Detroit of vicinity. Uh, he is um, here and uh, we want to acknowledge uh, the support and partnership that we have with the Detroit Council of Baptist Pastors of Vicinity. I also like to recognize members of the Universal uh, Unitary Church that are also involved in fighting uh, for this issue. Um, some of what you've heard some of the speakers talk about the, uh, the campaign like to acknowledge uh, the, the Michigan Time to Care Coalition. Uh, Rock is a, a large a member of that and they are leading uh, the fight. And that fight is, is far from over. It is just beginning. It is just beginning. 
our next speaker leads the largest uh, local chapter of, in civil rights in the entire world. She is the executive director of the Detroit NAACP organization that has uh, been at the forefront of civil rights in the city of Detroit uh, from when African-Americans arrived from the South all the way from the uh, legacy of Charles Hill to now you have Reverend Dr. Wendell Anthony and the uh, lead executive director who you will hear from, uh, the Honorable Camilla Landrum. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to everyone that has joined this morning to stand up for this uh, much needed press conference uh, to represent all uh, on behalf of our branch, President Reverend Dr. Wendell Anthony and the Detroit branch in ACP, you know, the NAACP and labor have had a marriage in civil rights and social justice for decades. Uh, historically, we fought side by side to produce groundbreaking legislation uh, in the areas of housing, jobs, and voting rights. Uh, and of course, we stand here again today fighting for labor uh, and minimum wage. We know that when we stand together, we win together, and we will win this fight for fairness and equity uh, in wages across this country. Every level of the NAACP, from our national down to our state conference, our youth councils, our branches, supports raising the minimum wage. Minimum, it's the least. It's the smallest amount or quantity possible. It's the least that's required. And why do we, Black and Brown people, those who are living in inner cities, those who don't always often have access to opportunity, why do we always have to have the minimum just to get by? Uh, when I remember uh, or look at you know, what it means for COVID-19 and those who uh, were on the front lines, the essential workers that were making sure that this country was working uh, and moving forward so that we could live our lives, we still tell them that all they deserve is the minimum and the minimum of their worth is seven twenty-five dollars an hour. That's inhumane and it's insane. Uh, people need money to live. It costs to be in this country and we shouldn't have to choose between a meal, uh, a kid's birthday party, getting gas in our car or paying a bill. The math is not right. It's not fair and it's not equitable. Uh, I am a former fast food worker, and then we weren't even at 725. Certainly, I know $15 is not enough, but it does put us, it puts us in a better position to be able to provide for our families and live how we would like to live. Uh, I know that there are other sides of the argument that says that, you know, raising the minimum wage will uh, lose jobs for this country. You know, jobs shift industry shift every single decade. We have saw that the auto industry in Michigan was huge. That industry is not as large anymore and you have more fast food workers, you have more low income uh, wage workers now and tip wage workers that are in this economy. Uh, we have to do something to protect those people. Uh, and we can't forget, we are human. Human interaction is required. And so just like we see technology work, we've also seen it not work. And if anybody has been in a a uh, grocery store line or, or a self-checkout line and needed somebody to come help you with that computer because it fails in the middle of your transaction, we need people. So let's end this fear tactic of showing how technology will help us lose jobs, but let us see how it will help people work together. Raising the wage is a gateway to economic sustainability for our communities. If we see the minimum wage rise, we will see home ownership rise. If we see the minimum wage rise, we'll see our economy grow, but we cannot continue to let people uh, not be paid what they are worth. And this battle is not over. We are not tired. We must remember that we fight until we win and we are not laying down. Uh, we will continue to advocate for the minimum wage to be raised in this nation. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Landrum. As she said, we are not tired. In fact, listening to all you all, you know when you're in a, a press conference, you get a little rhyming going on. We are inspired. We are not tired, we're inspired. We have our uh, staff in uh, Rock, Michigan. We have our staff at um, Rock United. And, and as our CEO, Dr. Seiko Sibi says, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's what we're talking about today. We're rising 
and tithe in formal wages and lifting that boat in the form of humanity, advancing humanity by shifting several industries. Our next speaker has been uh, doing that out representing the Western part of the state. This is also statewide. I want uh, members of the media and people to understand that this is a statewide um, push, our summer surge, carbon nationwide push, summer surge for justice. I bring to you coming out of a God's household of faith, an honorable Reverend Edward Pinkney, Reverend Pink. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm gonna thank Dr. Ferris for allowing me to be part of this because uh, on yesterday, we had our civil literacy conference uh, at God Households of Faith and we had more than 22 pastors to attend. And we got a commitment not only from, from the pastors there, also from the elected officials, because we also had six elected officials there also. And I got the opportunity to talk about $7.25 is not enough. And when I started talking about it, the first thing they came to mind, they never thought about it because most of them don't usually make more than that amount of money. You cannot survive on $7.25. And 25 cents. I don't care who you are, what you are, you cannot survive on it. And we have to make sure we stand together and fight against this, this thing. This is a monster. And what I did do yesterday, I got these people to sign on and I did tell them this and I got to do it. I told them I will sign, I will read the letter that I gave them so I don't deviate from what I told them. So I, I'm going to go through it the way I did yesterday. And it reads, July 23rd, 2021 is the Trump anniversary of when the federal minimum raise was last raised to $7.25. An increase is way overdue. But uh, economic growth have outpaced wages. If the minimum wage has been raised all the same, at the same pace as the productivity growth since the late 1960s, it will be well over $20 an hour. I had to tell them that. It is impossible to survive on $7.25 anywhere in this country. And at $7.25, full-time job pay less than the federal poverty threshold. In Michigan, the living wage for a single adult is $13.63, well above Michigan $9.65 minimum wage, according to the MIT living wage calculator. Michigan families deserve economic security. More than a third of the mothers in Michigan are single mothers, but the living wage for a single parent in Michigan is $31.15, more than three times the current minimum wage. We would have had this, but we was robbed. We had went out and got more than 400,000 signatures to change this, but they went into the back room and changed this thing around. And what we have to do we have to stand together and just say no more. I will not allow $7.25 to raise any family that anybody, a full-time job, this is more of a moral issue than anything else and we must stand up for it. And I say to each and everyone, and I told the, the pastors here in the city of Benton Harbor that we have to do something about it. We have to stand together and fight this thing. If we don't do it, it won't be done. And I, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Ferris once again for allowing this opportunity. Without her, this would not have been known down here in the city of Benton Harbor or Barron County, Michigan. And I really, really thank her. And I say, let's stand together. Let's fight this. $15. That's really not a whole lot either. But we must stand together and make sure it happens. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Reverend Pinkney. As we uh, conclude, our final speaker today is the Honorable Reverend Reginald Brantley of United Church of Christ and also a member of Rock United Board of Directors. We are pleased to have you here. And I now uh, turn it over to Reverend Reginald Brantley of United Church of Christ. Thank you so much, Christopher. I am really honored to be with you all today and to speak as a member of the Board of Directors of Rock United. And I acknowledge the presence 
of our president and CEO, Dr. Seavey. And I want to thank Dr. Farris for the opportunity when she alerted me to this press conference and said, of course, I want to be there. And I hail from New York, and we want to join all of you in Michigan in saying 725 is not enough. And I'm certainly honored to be with all the panelists who have spoken already so eloquently. It is, it is a, a joy and a privilege. And I just echo what they all said. You know, the, the Old Testament prophet Amos said, let justice roll down, let waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Well, righteousness has to do with personal integrity. It has to do with what do I see when I look in the mirror every morning? Am I pleased with what I have done? And then justice is the community's effort at righteousness. So it's up to us as leaders to say to the Congress of the United States, to the legislature of Michigan, to the legislature of the other 49 states, let justice take a hold of your hearts because you don't want to be a legislator standing on the day of judgment before Almighty God and say, I didn't vote to raise the minimum wage for people who need it. Help. And that's what this is all about. That's why I'm a proud, uh, proud to serve on the Rock United Board because it's an organization that's passionate about helping people, about lifting up the people in the food service industry and all workers because we know that we're fighting for a living wage, we're fighting for good benefits, we're fighting for safe working conditions and affordable health care. And as has been said before, We'll not tie it because the fight is only beginning. So let us remind our elected leaders, justice and righteousness, as theologian Emily Towns has said, they justice holds us accountable to the demands of love. So if you say you love your neighbor, let's see it in the legislation you pass. Let's see it in the causes you support. Let justice roll, let righteousness roll. Because God is watching. And one day, you and I will have to answer to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, what did you do during the war? Did you fight for the little people? And I pray to God that I'll be able to say yes. And I thank you for this opportunity to share in this moment. May God bless all of you and all of us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Brantley of the United Church of Christ and member of the Board of Directors for Rock United. At this time is a questions, the Q&A portion of this news conference. Uh, before I go, I will ask um, WDIV as well as WXYZ. We have two questions in the chat room and one of them is from uh, Greg Morris and he wants to know, um, he states that what some elected officials are having uh, issue understanding that no one can live off of 725 an hour. What communities and vote, what can communities and, and voters do? Uh, and I would like to know anybody on the panel would like to take a, a, a crack at answering that question. The question again is what can communities and voters do to raise the uh, minimum wage, federal minimum wage? from uh, $7.25 an hour to a livable wage? That's the question. I'll come in, I'll come in, Brother Chris. I, I think what's going to happen, what we're going to have to do is uh, as community leaders, uh, we're going to have to move um, our people to the polls. These individuals who are not uh, sympathetic to the needs of other people and who are living, I would call it the fat life, and not concerned about the people who are struggling, we need to get these people out of office. You know, we, we need to rally ourselves together and we need to know the names of these individuals uh, who are not supportive of this wage increase and that we need to move these people out of office. We need to vote them out of office. That's what we can do as a community, banding together, vote them out of office. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Mills. We have another question in the uh, chat room 
from uh, Yanwan Lee. Immigrant workers suffer with $7.25 an hour or lower. They are exploited by employers. What can the Asian American community do? What can the Asian American community do? Would anyone like to uh, answer that? I will step in and answer that. We can um, unify uh, in order to accomplish any uh, major feats and struggle to uh, empower and advance humanity. We as a, a world community must come together and find our commonalities and we can work together and must work together. And this panel is uh, demonstrating that. So we can work together. You can um, uh, meet with our local Iraq uh, representatives and we can have a, uh, uh, education uh, forms. We can uh, uh, target um, different areas that need the consciousness roles about this issue. So to answer that question, we must work together and not just only uh, for minimum wage, raising minimum wage, but raising the level of humanity and love that we must take and have to advance this world and to challenge the ills that we face as society. So the answer to the question is we will work together, all communities, all face working together to advance humanity and to bring attention to this issue. I now turn it over to uh, uh, members of the press. I will check and see if there are any other questions in the chat room, but I would like to uh, thank the press for uh, being, being here, the news and the press. And if any uh, individuals, I think Rep Salvi, you would like to take an answer. Thank you, Pastor White. And I would just add to those prior two questions that it is through election activism that we can change what the discussion is on minimum wage. We have to get our state legislature to become democratic, take the majority because these are the people that are interested in raising minimum wage, have co-sponsored and sponsored the bills to raise minimum wage. If we can take back the legislature next year, both in the House and the Senate, we can move this issue. And if Michigan moves the issue to at least $15 an hour, that puts added pressure on the federal government to then raise the minimum wage to $7, higher than $7.25 an hour, because as more and more states take this on, it puts that pressure on our national leaders. We can do this if we get the right people elected, and that can happen next year in the elections in the state house and state senate. Chris, if I can also add to that, in light of everything that has already been said, and I believe you said it, we must work together and realize that what affects one person affects another. And, and we have to realize that and all of us um, are connected. And I think the other piece of this thing is, as well is, we all realize that $15 is not enough. We need to work to set policy in place that once we reach that point, that we continue to increase it. Because at the end of the day, if people cannot take care of their families, that puts them in a position that they will stay on aid. They will continue to struggle. And we have to work to make sure uh, that, that that minimum wage stays with uh, the cost of living, with inflation, that people can be able to take care of their families. So definitely, as you stated, we all must work together because, again, what affects one group affects all of us. And until everyone uh, is at a place where they're able to, to take care of their families, none of us can be comfortable. None of us can be satisfied until right. every community is in position where they can be able to, to take care of themselves. Thank you. Hey, Reverend Thank Pickney you. here. I, I just want to add to what you're saying because I, I think it's crucial that we educate the people about uh, uh, the, the living wage because a lot of people don't know. Uh, even in my conference on yesterday, uh, you know, when I said seven dollars and twenty-five cents was a federal rate, they looked at me like you know that I wasn't being truthful because I said, "Well, that is uh, the minimum wage that you know federal wide." And I said, "You know, you can look it up." So they we looked it up and they we found out it was true. But we have to educate them. Sometimes when you're making twenty-five dollars an hour and and I'm making uh, a seven dollars and twenty-five cents, you don't look at that as a problem. Most people don't. So what we got to do, we got to continue to educate, 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 
We got to tell them all about it. And if we don't do that, then we, we you know, we're, we're missing the boat. We got to hold these elected officials accountable for their action, their inaction, and their words. And we got to make sure that they do what's right for the people. Thank you. I will take uh, time to uh, have uh, our comms team uh, unmute any uh, mics from the media. We have WDIV as well as W. X, Y, Z, are there any questions? Please identify yourself as you ask your questions and uh, one of the panelists uh, will be able to answer it. So at this time, uh, we go forward with Q and A. Good evening, everyone. Do we have any questions from uh, members of the media? There's one a question from Greg Morris, uh, Chris. It's in the chat. I posted it. From Greg Morris, it sounds like ethnic community organizations need to do more together. What are they doing? Anything special? Well, um, that's something that uh, when you see throughout various communities, we have community centers and uh, we have to uh, go on uh, a mission to find those that are doing the work. This is just a start. And that's a beautiful question because that's something that during our summer surge for justice, we will um, move to make sure that happens. Because as I said earlier, um, Greg, our CEO, Dr. Seiko Sibi says, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's, that's, this is a step. So I can't, you know, clearly say, well, this person, this community is doing that. And this person, that community is doing that. But I do know uh, that throughout this state, you have several organizations that are doing the work. A rock, we're working with the uh, My Time to Care Coalition. There are several groups. We have the, the Universal Unitarian Church that is involved in this call and, and the leaders and speakers Detroit NAACP, so we have that uh, group, a uh, uh, collective that is working to um, address this issue and understanding that this issue is a part of a larger issue that has to be addressed, uh, making uh, humanity better. And that's, and you can't do it without a livable wage. We have a difficult time uh, trying to move humanity forward. When you're waiting for the bus and it may not come or you're having issues trying to find child care for your child while you work during the busy times of your uh, job, uh, finding good quality uh, education without a wage, it's difficult to sit and help your child complete their without. homework. So, is things so this is part of uh, uh that's the answer to your question now any additional uh questions from the media or anybody else want to take a stab at that uh question or answer that question yes yeah. i, I do dr sibi wants to answer that oh question. okay let me yeah. refer to dr sibi <laughs> thank you for the question i think uh something really important at the rock seas is uh to make change possible we need to build power and in order to build power we need to work with other people so how do we work with other people? It is uh, putting an emphasis in organizing, agitating, and educating other community members so we can work together. What Rock decided to do as of late is a hire an organ policy organizer who will be in charge of connecting with other communities because we know what we want to, to get done, but we cannot do it alone. So we're hiring uh, from the great state of Mississippi, Dr. Long, who will be our policy uh, coordinator, who will be talking to many organizations uh, who are not necessarily working with us so that we can build a bridge between our organization of our organization in order to build the power. Once we're capable of building power, we'll be, we will be able to make change possible. We just need to look at the great model that was done by Stacey Abram in uh, Georgia. What was possible was communities working across and going together to defeat those who were against the change. 
So is that possible? Yes, but we need to put the money where we need to put it because we need to hire the people who will be in charge of making those connections possible and put an emphasis in organizing over communities and talking to them so that we can make those changes possible. Of course, $15 an hour is not enough at all, but it is a beginning and we can work on it. And we should not let any community be behind because they don't have, they have a language barrier. That's not enough. It is a wealth of power that's a sitting there, that's unused. And we need to lift that power and make sure it is used for the purpose of everybody. Chris, I do want to mention, uh, just to add to what Dr. Sibby uh, shared, that in Michigan, I think it's, it's appropriate that we announce that for this press conference and the summer surge, that 20 organizations signed on, faith and community-based organizations. And you can find that information on the website for this event. So that's pretty powerful in about a week's time that 20 organizations said, yes, we're willing to work and to sign on uh, to this kind of effort. So that's, that's awesome. And there's so many more. And this is locally in Michigan. That's and this is the beginning of a four state surge that's going to go throughout a five state surge that's going to go throughout the entire nation. So I also invite anyone who's in the chat who's not already a member of ROT to please get involved with the summer surge. It's a summer surge for justice. And as you've heard from the CEO, you've heard from the chief operating officer, and we have several people in here. We're, we're doing the work and uh, we're proud of today. And this is just the beginning. We are not tired. We are inspired. And 725 is not enough. $15 an hour is not enough. We want a livable wage because that, as Dr. Sippy has eloquently said, a rising tide lifts all boats. I'd like to know before we close, we have comments because we're a minute over. And I also would like one final bit of housekeeping. This conference will air again on our Facebook page at 11.30. It will air again at 11.30. It's important to note that. Uh, and, and if there are any other comments, if not, uh, we will conclude um, this uh, news conference. There's a few more questions. Uh, uh, we have two, actually, two other questions. Yeah. There's a question from John Wong Lee asking how can Asian American Pacific Islanders participate and help with the minimum wage fight? And I think what you just said, getting involved in campaigns like that, uh, if, they, if, they, if they're in Michigan or wherever they are, but looking for those allies, as you said earlier, is crucial. Uh, allying with Rock United or other organizations that are already deeply involved in this fight. And maybe contacting their elected officials to, to get more information. And finally, as we conclude, uh, we have information. If you have any other questions, uh, we will be available throughout the day. Um, any questions, I'll, um, you can refer to the website that we have that, uh, and you can direct those questions to our comms team and we will uh, be available to answer them. And more important than answering the questions, we are taking action. We are taking action. And I wanna take the time to thank everyone, uh, the panelists. I wanna also take the time to thank you for committing yourselves to advancing humanity uh, through Rock Michigan, and Rock United. That concludes our news conference for today. I want everyone to have a wonderful Friday. Thank you.